Here, 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 Circuit Court Branch 33 in a former Milwaukee County is now in session. The Honorable Lawrence C. Graham Jr. presiding. Silence is commanded. You may be seated. Just have a seat, please. Doctor, you understand that you continue in the room. I do, Your Honor. Cross examination. <clears throat> Thank you, Judge. Good morning, Dr. Becker. Good morning, Ms. Um As we ended yesterday, uh, we were talking about a couple of things, and I think I'd like to start by narrowing the issues that we're dealing with in the case, okay? One of the last things was um, an exhibit presented by Mr. Boyle of the temple that Jeffrey Dahmer drew, correct? Yes. Now, I think you indicated that that was of interest to you because it was psychotic-like, correct? Um, that's correct. However, ultimately, after your examination, you could not find any evidence or you could not find sufficient evidence to support a diagnosis of psychosis on the part of Jeffrey Dahmer, correct? That's correct. All right. Um, another thing that could be an issue in the case is whether or not Jeffrey Dahmer had the substantial capacity to appreciate the wrongfulness of his conduct, correct? That's correct. And I believe you indicated on direct that you made a finding to a reasonable degree of psychological certainty that at all relevant times, Jeffrey Dahmer could understand the wrongfulness of his conduct, correct? Correct. And what did you base that on? Um, I based that on both questions that I asked him several times in meeting with him, and that is, did he know that it was wrong to take a person's life? And he indicated when I asked him that, that he knew that it was wrong to do that. Okay. So essentially, the issues that we're left with, to your understanding, are whether or not Jeffrey Dahmer suffered from a mental disease. That's correct. And whether or not that mental disease substantially impaired his ability to conform his conduct to the requirements of law, correct? Those two issues were what we were left with. Okay. Let's first talk briefly about mental disease. The mental disease that you diagnosed was paraphilia? Uh, it was necrophilia, which is a form of paraphilia. All right. Now, I, I, I'm going to ask the doctor, you pull the mic up a little higher. I think it will look That's great. That's fine. Thank you. All right. Now, I think, and I may have misheard you, that at the end of the testimony yesterday, you indicated that not all necrophilics have a mental disease. Is that correct? Um, uh, that is what I said. And would you like me to explain that? Yes, please. Okay. All right. Um, in order to make the diagnosis of necrophilia, a person has to have either acted, uh, that is, they have intense sexual fantasies or urges, number one, that they have acted on, or number two, that they are distressed by. Um, hypothetically, there can be people out there who on occasion have thoughts or are attracted to thoughts about being sexual sexual with corpses, but they might not have ever acted on those urges, and they might not be distressed by them. And in that case, I would not call that uh, a mental disease. All right. So the fantasy or the urge becomes a mental disease because of the distress and or the act itself. That's correct. Okay. I just want to refer to one other thing. This is Defendant's Exhibit 27. Concerning, why don't you identify the procedure? It's the uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Um, uh, it's the third version, and it's been revised. And um, this is what is used to make diagnosis in the field of mental health. And indeed, the committee concerning Paraphilia is the committee on which you serve. That's correct. Is there's also a cautionary statement concerning the category in this manual? Is that correct? That's correct. And 
Does this cautionary statement get you started with it to the word disability? Does that appear? It says it is to be understood that inclusion here for clinical and research purposes of a diagnostic category such as pathological gambling or pedophilia does not imply that the condition meets legal or other non-medical criteria for what constitutes mental disease, mental disorder, or mental disability. All right. Now, <clears throat> It would still be fair to substitute the word necrophilia for pedophilia in that cautionary statement, would it not? Well, it was not substituted in there, so I would not feel comfortable saying it would be fair to do that. All right. So in other words, of the paraphilias, only pedophilia? That cautionary statement well, applies to? Again, or well, is that just I'm sorry, or is that just an example? Um, I did not write the cautionary um, statement. And so it's difficult for me to know if that is just one example that they meant. Um, they didn't list the other forms of, uh, of paraphilia. All right. Could you read that statement once again? Sure. It is to be understood that inclusion here for clinical and research purposes of a diagnostic category such as pathological gambling or pedophilia does not imply that the condition meets legal or other non-medical criteria of what constitutes mental disease, mental disorder, or mental disability. All right. Now, having reread that, the words such as a diagnostic category, does that not indicate to you that they're listing examples? That could be interpreted that way. Fine. Um, <laughs> Do you agree that psychiatrists and psychologists differ on whether or not a paraphilia is a mental disease for legal purposes? I do. But let's talk about the specific paraphilia here, necrophilia, which you, in your report, indicated you considered in Jeffrey Dahmer's case of mental disease, okay? Yes. First, in talking about paraphilias, in shorthand, is the major difference between paraphilias and normal sexual desires, the object of that sexual desire, um, it, it, indeed. Okay. So in other words, if someone is intensely sexually attracted, a man's intensely sexually attracted to a redheaded woman, that's not a paraphilia. Um, as long as it's an adult male and adult female, and she consents to be, uh, well, just the attraction in itself would not be considered a paraphilia. Okay. okay. However, if an adult male is intensely sexually attracted to, and I'm not trying to be facetious, instead of red hair, red shoes, uh -huh. that's a paraphilia. Well, it would be diagnosed as a paraphilia um, if he um, uh, had a fetish. We would call that a fetish, fetish. perhaps, okay? So uh, if he held on to the red shoes, if he used it to masturbate, if he acted on that attraction, or if he was markedly distressed by his interest in red shoes. Okay. However, going back, um, you said markedly distressed. If the distress or the action is what makes it a mental disease, but a man could have, without being mentally, mentally diseased, thoughts or fantasies concerning these shoes, correct? A person could have thoughts or fantasies about um, shoes, and if uh, it didn't bother them or if they didn't do something with the shoes, we wouldn't diagnose them as having a fetish, which is a paraphilia. But again, the major point is it's the difference in the nature of the object that's the... It's the difference in the nature of what is the object of the intense sexual desire, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, <clears throat> when you were talking specifically about Mr. Dahmer yesterday, 
you indeed indicated, I believe at one point, that you were almost uncomfortable with the word necrophilia as a complete diagnosis because you didn't have a term for his sexual attraction to the unconscious, sleeping, breathing man with a heartbeat, correct? Um, th that's correct. In searching the literature, I, I could not find a philia listed to define attraction to someone who is placed in a comatose state and is uh, in a coma when you're doing something sexual to them. All right. But you indicated that essentially, other than the fact that the, the man in the comatose state was breathing and had a heartbeat and the deceased was a corpse that for the purposes of the definition, it essentially made no difference, correct? Well, the fact is the person was, was out. They could not interact um, with Jeffrey. Right. So for the purposes of the definition you came up with, that did not make a big difference, correct? Well, in terms of I made... Um, the diagnosis of necrophilia on two things. One, his behaviors, that is that he did engage in sexual activity with a number of corpses. Two, he reported to me that his that 25 percent of his erotic uh, interest pattern was to being sexual with a corpse. So it was on both those factors. That's true. But he also reported that 75 percent was to the comatose person. That's correct. That's what he right. self-reported. Now, while well, for the purposes of your ultimate definition or diagnosis of mental disease, that did not make a difference. The difference between the person who was breathing and with a heartbeat and the corpse was the homicide occurring, correct? That's correct. And Mr. Dahmer's responsibility in taking a person from stage one to stage two is the entire issue in this case, correct? That's correct. So there, the distinction is legally very important. That's correct. Okay. Now, let's go to page 19 of your notes. Do you have them? Actually, it starts right on the bottom of page 18, and we're talking about Mr. Dahmer's eighth victim, Ernest Miller. And starting with the last word there, is this how it reads? He, pro he propositioned him and then went with him to his apartment. He had only a few pills available. While he, this would be Ernest Miller, was asleep, he thought, how should I keep him? He did not want to put this person through any pain, and consequently he stabbed him in the jugular. He reported that the victim died quickly. Mr. Dahmer reported that he had to consume alcoholic beverages before he was able to stab the person. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Now... Visualizing that moment in time, am I correct that what we have here is a live, sleeping, comatose man? And Mr. Dahmer, according to what he reported to you, says, how shall I keep him? Because he doesn't have enough pills, is afraid he'll wake up if he strangles him. And at that moment, Mr. Dahmer reaches outside himself to get alcohol to diminish his resistance to killing and then gets a knife after he's consumed alcohol and cuts the throat of Ernest Miller. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Okay. So, Mr. Dahmer, who indicated to you that and I believe indicated throughout his interviews that the actual act of killing was distasteful to him and he'd seek the aid of alcohol in doing it. 
used alcohol here to help impair his ability to conform his conduct to the requirements of law. Isn't that correct? In, in the case of um, Ernest Miller, um, he reported to me that indeed he took alcohol because he wanted to keep this person and he didn't have the pills available to do it. And so he needed to stab him and drinking helped him feel better about stabbing Ernest Miller. It helped him feel better and helped him impair his ability yes. to conform his conduct to the requirements of law. That's correct. That's true. Okay. All right. Now, let's refer to page 16 in your notes. Early on in that page, when we're can there's the continuation of his description to you of what occurred with James Doxeter, who's referred to as victim number three, but is actually the first charged victim here. Mr. Dahmer reports to you that his compulsion was in full swing at this time, correct? Ms. White, could you just tell me where on page I'm, 16? I'm then? very sorry. It's, it's okay. The top partial paragraph, the next to the last line. His compulsion was in full swing at this time. Okay, according to Mr. Don right. I That's have. correct. Okay. That's what he says at the time that he has killed James Doxeter, the first charged victim. That's correct. what he reported to me. That's correct. Okay. However, later on, and we're now going to deal with the end of the second paragraph. After he has killed Richard Guerrero, yet another killing. He reports the following. He reports the incident with the juvenile SS in this case, and that in that case, he did not plan to kill him, the juvenile. The reason he did not plan to kill him was that he had to go to work that night, and that helped him control his compulsion, correct? That's what he reported. All right. So... Although he reported that his compulsion was in full swing after he had killed James Doxeter, he killed yet another person, and then later, because he had to go to work, was able to conform his conduct to the requirements of law and not kill a drugged victim, correct? Ms. White, that's why he, that's what he reported was the reason why he didn't kill him. I, I can't say that that is the reason, but that's what Jeffrey reported. Right. The fact remains, does it not, that that man remained alive, correct? That's correct. And therefore, Jeffrey Dahmer's interaction with that man, while in the full swing of his compulsion, conformed to the requirements of law, did it not? In, in that case, he did not commit a homicide. That's correct. Yeah. Let's move on to an even more interesting incident, perhaps. It would be on page 18. And here we're dealing with the juvenile LP, the man that Mr. Dahmer, it's the central paragraph there, right. the man that Mr. Dahmer reported that he had at his apartment that he struck with a mallet and indeed tried to strangle. First of all, you read the um, 
the statement of Mr. Dahmer that was supplied to you, correct? His confession made yes. to the police, yes. Okay. And the version here differs somewhat from the statement as it was provided to you in that in that statement, Mr. Dahmer reports that this person came back voluntarily with him to his apartment on one day. He released him knowing that they'd meet the next day and that the incident described here with the mallet and the attempted strangulation all occur on the second meeting. Yes. All right. Now. That first day when there is contact between Mr. Dahmer and LP, and this I believe so we can put it in time, is after he has killed his sixth victim. This day, Mr. Dahmer conforms his conduct to the requirements of law the first day and releases the man to meet him the next day, correct? Correct. Now, on the second day, we have the following incident according to his report. Mr. Dahmer did not have any pills available to him that weekend. Mr. Dahmer went to an army surplus store and bought a mallet. He took pictures and had him, that being LP, lay on his stomach, struck him in the back of the neck with the mallet. The guy got up, first of all, stopping there. Do you believe that was an attempt by Mr. Dahmer to kill LP? Um, I don't know if it was an attempt to kill him. It was an attempt certainly to knock him out and render him unconscious. Okay. The guy got up and attempted to leave the apartment and said he would call the police. The guy left and then came back in and asked Mr. Dahmer for money for a cab. Mr. Dahmer tried to strangle him at this point. That is an attempt to kill him, is yes. it not? But then calmed down and they both went into the bedroom. All right. Let's go to the last portion of that. We have a moment in time again. When here, Mr. Dahmer has a juvenile, LP, who's indicated he's going to leave him. Mr. Dahmer has, from his description, his hands around his throat and is attempting to extinguish that man's life. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, he conforms his conduct to the requirements of law and stops, correct? Correct. He, he did not strangle LP. So would you say that in that case, Mr. Dahmer was responsible? Um, I think, Ms. White, what I'd be comfortable in saying is because of the struggle, <clears throat> excuse me, Jeffrey saw... Um, that he was not going to be able to win this struggle and at that point stop struggling. All right. In other words, if he can't win the fight, he can control <clears throat> his conduct, conform his conduct to the requirements of law? Um, not, I'm not saying that in all cases. I'm saying that in regard to, to LP, it, it didn't work out the way Jeffrey um, envisioned it working out in terms of what his fantasies were and what he does with his victims. And okay. there was a struggle. Dr. Becker, let's go through it this way then. In the case of LP, because he couldn't win the struggle, he was able to conform his conduct to the requirements of law and not kill, correct? He, he did not kill LP. He was able to conform his conduct to the requirements of law in not killing him, correct? That's correct. Okay. In the case of SS, because he had to get to work, 
he was able to conform his conduct to the requirements of law and not kill him, correct? Um, Ms. White, if I can say that he did not kill the person you just mentioned, but I don't know that I believe that it was because he had to get to work. Right. For but a, the fact is, he that's what he, he did said, not kill and he did not in kill him. In his interaction where he had drugged SS, as he had drugged his other victims, in his interaction with the SS, which you'll admit was sexual interaction, he conformed his conduct to the requirements of law. His reported reason was he had to get to work, but for some reason, he didn't. Was, did not kill him and therefore was able to conform his conduct to the requirements of law. Let's go on to, I believe this is page 20. Right after Mr. Dahmer has reported killing his ninth victim, David Thomas, and here he says he went to Chicago for a vacation and met a man at a bath club. The man was black. They went back to his apartment and Mr. Dahmer drugged him. Mr. Dahmer stated that for some reason he did not do anything else. He just masturbated and kissed the guy and the guy left. He did not kill this man. And he felt that it might be that he was not, was not as, I think that should read, it says as not, was not as attracted to him as he thought he would be, correct? That's correct. So in this case, after having killed his ninth victim, while involved in sexual interaction at a man that, with a man that he met at a bath club, having that man back at his apartment where he has killed several victims already, having him drugged, he conforms his conduct to the requirements of law and does not kill, correct? That's correct. Which page is that, please? It's 20. 20. It's page 20, the first full paragraph. Thanks. Actually, yes, that's right. The first full paragraph. Okay. Now, there was one incident here, I believe, that um, may not be reflected in your notes, but are you aware of the incident in West Dallas at his grandmother's house? where that involved a person whose name I can use since he's an adult, Ronald Flowers? I'm, I'm aware of that. Um, I, I did not obtain that information from Jeffrey, but from the police reports. Okay. That incident from the police reports, which were Mr. Dahmer's statement, included... The description of him having the person at his grandmother's house, having the person drugged, having the person in his planning, he'd crushed the pills before he left, just as he did, we'll take Anthony Sears in this case, whose incident he did report. He, he'd crushed the pills ahead of time, just as he had with Anthony Sears, correct? Correct. And... From your reading of the confession and his report to you concerning Anthony Sears, in each case, he had the two of them driven to the vicinity of his grandmother's house, but dropped off some distance from it. So he couldn't be traced to his grandmother's house, correct? That's, that's my understanding. And in each case, the person was drugged and helpless inside the grandmother's house. Is that correct? That's correct. Because the grandmother saw Ronald Flowers, according to Mr. Dahmer's report to the police, he did not kill him, but he did kill Anthony Sears, correct? Correct. So when he interacted with Ronald Flowers, he was able, in regard to the homicide, to conform his conduct 
to the requirements of law, correct? Ms. White, if I can just say that, um, again, that I did not discuss Mr. Flowers with Jeffrey, but based on what I read in the police reports, in that case, he conformed his conduct. Okay, and what you read in the police reports were Mr. Dahmer's report of what had occurred. Okay. Correct. Now, you've indicated that at the time of each of the charged homicides, that it's your opinion that Mr. Dahmer was unable to conform his conduct to the requirements of law, correct? That's correct. I've discussed a number of incidents surrounding a number of the homicides where he did conform his conduct to the requirements of law, correct? Yes, you did. Yes. So his responsibility or the way we know whether or not he's responsible is the fact that when someone dies, he's not, correct? Let me see if I, if I um, understand what you're saying. Uh, am I saying that he is only not responsible for his behavior when a person dies? What I'm saying is the way we know that he's not able to conform his conduct to the requirements of law is that when he's not, we have a dead body. Someone dies, correct? That's correct. So that's the one differing factor, correct? I just want to make the distinction here that um, I'm not saying that he doesn't have a paraphilia uh, in those other cases, but he violates the law when he takes someone's life. Okay, that's... Uh, we're not talking about the mental disease. I was on the second prong, and I'm glad you brought that up. Um, let's go back to the incident with LP. Jeffrey Dahmer has his hands around LP's throat and is attempting to kill LP, and he's attempting to kill LP to continue LP's presence with him because of his paraphilia, correct? Um, that's correct. <clears throat> While in the act of strangling LP, <clears throat> Mr. Dahmer finds the ability to conform his conduct to the requirements of law and does not kill him, correct? He doesn't kill him. I don't know that I would be comfortable saying that um, he finds the strength to conform his conduct. I think he lost the struggle with LP. I think he saw he was not going to be able to kill him and then have the body and do what he wanted with the body. So he doesn't kill him and his conduct conforms to the requirements of law, correct? He doesn't kill him. Right. Okay. He, had he won the struggle at that time, at that same moment in time, and LP were another victim, would it be your conclusion that he lacked the capacity to conform his conduct to the requirements of law? Yes. Therefore, <laughs> The result, the death itself, is what ultimately tells you that he was unable to conform his conduct, correct? Correct. I have a few more things. May I have just a minute?
Back on the LP incident, um, were you aware, either from Mr. Dahmer or any other source, that at one point he had LP bound with a cord? Um, I, I recall reading that, and I think it was in the police report. So a person who was bound wound up living um, at that particular point from Mr. Dahmer's report, either to you or to the police, correct? I'm sorry, your statement was the person bound, wound up living. Right. That's a person correct. who was bound either from Mr. Dahmer's report to the police or report to you wound up living in that particular case, correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, you're aware, are you not, that when asked, Mr. Dahmer indicated that the reason for these homicides was his own warped, selfish desire for self-gratification. That's the way he phrased it, correct? That's correct. And by reason there, we're talking about his motive in doing what he did, correct? Um, when he makes that statement, is he telling us why he did what he did? Yes. Yes. And indeed, in your report of his statements, we have, I'm sorry, your reports of his statement, we have on page 12, for example, um, on the bottom, that He reported he started using the sleeping pills during this period because some guys wanted to perform anal sex and he did not want to. This was a way of keeping them. Specifically, Mr. Dahmer did not want to be the recipient of anal sex and consequently, if he were to drug the person, they would then fall asleep and he would not have to participate in anal sex where he was the receptive partner. Correct? That's what he said. Okay. That's choice that the sexual activity will be his way without taking into consideration the needs or desires of the other person could be defined as a selfish choice, could it not? Yes, it could. I refer you to page 24. This would be toward the end of the third complete paragraph. I asked Mr. Dahmer again why he killed his victims. He reported he did not just drug them and have sex with them and let them leave because he wanted to keep them. He wanted to them to stay with him. In other words, Mr. Dahmer reported that while he drew sexual pleasure from these people while they were alive and comatose. His ultimate choice to do the act of killing was to extend his period of sexual pleasure with them, correct? That's correct. And he did indicate to you that the act of killing itself 
was not what gave him gratification, correct? That's correct. And that indeed he drank in order to make himself more able to do that actual act of homicide, correct? That's what he reported. Now, Mr. Dahmer, in doing this, in extending, in taking a person's life so that he would have a longer period of sexual pleasure with that person, was doing a selfish act, was he not? Yes, he was. If Mr. Dahmer reported to you that I drugged the person and had sex with them, and then I killed them, but I'm not a necrophiliac. I have whatever philia it would have been that he's only around <clears throat> to comatose bodies. But I killed them because this would be a living witness. I killed the witness. Mm -hmm. Would you hold him responsible for that homicidal act? Okay. He drugged a person. He had sex with them right. while they he, were he's comatose. Got that paraphilia. The comatose okay. paraphilia. The comatose one. Okay. And then while the person is drugged, he kills that person. Uh huh. And he says, and the reason I kill that person, it's no sex afterwards. Uh -huh. The reason I kill that person now is because I've already done a criminal act. And if that person is alive, they're going to report me to the police. So now I'm getting rid of the witness. Mm -hmm. okay. Would you hold him responsible for that act of homicide? Um, yes, I would. Ma'am, isn't the only difference between that and this the fact that he had a sexual motivation as well as getting rid of the evidence that led him to extend his period of time with the person? The nature of his... Excuse me, I think that was a yes or no question. Could you repeat it? Excuse me, Judge, that's just not fair. This witness in response to this question is about to give an answer. You should be allowed to give it, and if it doesn't meet, you can move that to be stricken. You can't stop it from starting the answer. It's not fair. Objections overruled. I think that initially the witness can answer in the answer no manner, and then if the examiner wishes for an explanation, the examiner can ask for that explanation. The examiner does not ask for an explanation. The attorney and, uh, who presented the witness in redirect and ask for the explanation. Can you repeat the question then? I think she's the one who's supposed to ask me. And, sure. and, and I'm supposed to answer yes or no? But no, I haven't heard the question. I haven't okay. heard the question. Okay. So because I have Let, to... Let's go back to what we had before. I might say this. I think any witness has the right when I uh, ask to answer a question yes or no to say simply I am unable to answer it that way. And then, okay. and but, then but the questioner way. will just have to go on. Uh, I understand, but I really do want to have that last question right back, so I'm prepared to ask it and redirect. Would you read, read the question back, man? Fine. Just a second. Do you want to rephrase it? Or do you um, want to read it? I believe the, the, the question I asked which preceded it was whether or not if Jeffrey Dahmer had sexual interaction with a comatose person that he drugged and then killed that comatose person, deriving no pleasure from the killing, and indicated that the reason he had killed that person was to get rid of the witness would he be responsible for that act? And your answer to that was yes, he would be. Yes. The difference between that scenario 
and Jeffrey Dahmer's killing to keep them for some extended pleasure is the motive for the killing, correct? Correct. Just a second. Need one more second. Okay, I only have two other very brief things. Um, one yesterday at the close of the day, you indicated. Uh, that Mr. Dahmer had reported some additional um, necrophilic acts to you um, in your most recent interview. I just need to know when that interview took place. Um, I arrived here, I believed it was on Sunday, and uh, went to the prison and uh, spent, uh, it was anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half um, with Jeffrey um, to ask some further questions, and it was at that time. All right. And ma'am, were you alone with him? Was Dr. Berlin with Dr. Him? Berlin was with me, and also one of his attorneys. Okay. Um, now, I just need to ask one more thing that I noticed yesterday. Yesterday, you spent, you did spend some considerable time at Mr. Boyle's request reading the the 26 pages of the in-depth interview right. you, you took with Mr. Don. Um, now, Dr. Becker, um, you have testified previously in court, but I think we established that that was concerning evaluation and treatment very often of sexual offenders and their reintegration perhaps into the community, correct? That's correct. And this is the first time you've testified on the responsibility issue in any case and particularly in a homicide case. That's correct. correct. All right. Now, you read your notes virtually verbatim yesterday, correct? That's correct. In looking at your notes, are you aware, ma'am, that the name Jeff or Jeffrey never appears. It's always Mr. Mr. Dahmer. Dahmer. That's correct. Are you aware that you continuously change the name to Jeff or Jeffrey? Um, your pointing it out makes me aware that I did that. Okay. So until now, you have not been aware of that until um, I just pointed it out? I mean, when I, when I was reading it yesterday, I saw Mr. Dahmer, but I said Jeffrey. Okay. Okay. Ma'am, you're a psychologist. Do you think that shows a certain psychological closeness you've developed to the defendant? No, it does not. I, I mean, it could be interpreted that way, but uh, I don't think that's the case. Okay. You looked at the words Mr. Dahmer. Yes. And the name Jeff or Jeffrey came out of your mouth, but you don't believe that's because of any particular closeness you feel for him? I do not. I have nothing further, but thank you very much. Well, well, you weren't told to do that, were you? You weren't told to personalize the calling. No, I was not. Okay. Now, we're talking about acts of homicide here. And I just want to ask you a few questions in light of this uh, white uh, cross-examination. Uh, she asked you to assume that the reason in her assumption that this person killed after having sex with a comatose person was to get rid of a witness that could testify against him. That's correct. Do you believe that is the reason that Mr. Dahmer killed? I do not. So that 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 uh, assumption that was asked of you was that if a person was suffering from uh, the mental disease that you have attributed to Mr. Dahmer, and that his object of his in, 
fantasy, but simply to have sex with a person who he rendered comatose. And after having all of that sex, he then killed the person. As it related to that homicide, he wouldn't be non-responsive. If, if Mr. Boyle, if I may say something, because I had to answer that yes or no. Sure. That was a hypothetical. And the fact is that if an individual did that, I mean, the person would have to be thoroughly evaluated because the fact is you might have a psychotic individual who then might not be responsible for having done that. Um, hypotheticals make me uncomfortable. Um, but in the hypothetical that Ms. White was asking, she... She and she put in a, a pretty interesting fact that the only reason for the killing was to get rid of the witness. Now, we don't have that here, do we? We do not. So although in the abstract, her your answers were directed to her question, uh, that uh, assumption is not uh, uh, the question before you as it has been in your cross and direct examination as to Jeffrey Dahmer's mental responsibility as it relates to his acts of homicide. That's correct. Uh, the witness has used the term hypothetical question, and I think maybe it might be helpful to the jurors if I instruct them right now a little bit about what a hypothetical sure. question is, because some witnesses are allowed to answer a question that we call a hypothetical question. Now, a hypothetical question is where a witness is asked to assume certain facts as being true, and from those assumptions to draw uh, as to what conclusions they would draw. Now. A hypothetical question is only valid to the extent that the assumptions are valid. And you, the jurors, are the ones, based on the testimony in this case, that have to decide the validity of those assumptions. Go ahead, Mr. Porter. Sure. Judge, uh, uh, doctor, yeah. one of the things I neglected to ask you in direct was, you and I have entered into a retainer agreement. Yes. Would you tell us, uh, for the record, what the uh, sum and substance of that is? Um, yes, that I am to receive $5,000 plus whatever my expenses are. Let's talk about philias. Have you ever found a philia, a necrophilia that you've told us? You look to see if there was a philia of someone that was, amongst other things, wanting to render someone comatose in order to have sex. Correct. And what did you do to determine whether or not there was such a philia in existence? My um, name. I reviewed the literature in this area. Did you find any that fit? No. Did you go back to um, uh, necrophilia? What's necro mean? Um, a corpse. Okay. What's a, is it in that Greek word? The derivative yeah. of a Greek word? Is there a derivative of a Greek word for a person who is also, besides being a necrophilia, wants to have a comatose philia? I'm not all that familiar um, with uh, Greek and don't have a, a Greek dictionary available to me. So if we were to derive one, it would be whatever the Greek word for coma is and philia at the end of it. Okay, now, in the, in the literature and in the Bible of the DSM, I keep, I call it the Bible, but the DSM 3R, have you reviewed that to decide whether or not we know that is in there? Yes, yes. Now, do you have, uh, have you searched there to see if there has been instances sufficiently reported that the people who put together the DSMR are looking for a person who had a paraphilia, and that paraphilia also included or was singularly for having sex by com making someone comatose and, and having sex with them. There one in there? It, it's not mentioned. You keep on using the word Jeffrey reported, Jeffrey reported as you have testified. Now, when Mr. Dahmer was telling you things, you would mark down what he was saying. And then in many of your responses, he said he reported things to you. That's correct. Now, if Mr. Dahmer, assume that Mr. Dahmer was psychotic, I mean, suffering from uh, severe schizophrenia, and he was telling you that he was doing what he was doing because Martians landed in his neighborhood and told him to do that, and I asked you what he told you, you would say he reported 
that Martian landed in his neighborhood and told him to do it. That's correct. You'd say it that way. I would. But you wouldn't believe that. I would not believe that Martians landed, no. Okay. Now, when Mr. Dahmer reported to you that he was doing the things he was doing because he wanted to achieve A, B, and C, did you accept that as an absolute fact? I, I do not accept that as an absolute fact. What is it that Mr. Dahmer reported to you, perhaps, when he said, um, I used alcohol to carry out the killing of Mr. Miller because I, was, I had run out of sleeping pills and I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to kill him, so alcohol, I used alcohol in order to commit the act. He reported that to you. He did. Does that in any way change your opinion at that moment in time? Because that's what we're talking about. At the time of the commission of the offense, he was suffering from the mental disease that you told us. No, it doesn't. Lacked substantial capacity to conform his conduct to requirements of law. No, he he wanted to engage in sexual acts with that corpse, and that was the way. That is what he had to do to obtain the corpse. So the alcohol reporting was a matter of reporting. Did it alter your opinion that if he had not had alcohol available to him, he would not have killed Mr. Miller? Uh, it's quite possible that he would have killed him. Was he at that time, whether he killed him or not, suffering from a mental disease? Yes, he was. Now, conforming or not conforming to the requirements of law doesn't mean respect for the law, does it? No. Well, I mean, um, uh, most people conform their behavior because in part they've got a respect for the law. Of course. So if, if a person says, I'm not going to do that because that's against the law, that person is conforming to the requirements of the law. If a person says, I don't care what the law says, I'm going to do what I want to do, he's not conforming to the law, correct? Correct. Now, if a person has a mental disease and says, I'm not going to conform to the law, that doesn't mean he's not responsible unless his capacity to conform to the law is impaired. Isn't that true? That's correct. And in these instances, it's your testimony that each and every time of these homicides, he had a mental disease. Yes. And the result of that mental disease, that it affected his capacity to conform his conduct to requirements of law. Yes. Substantially. Yes. And that was made to a reasonable degree of psychiatric certainty. Um, I'm not a psychiatrist, so I'd have to be psychological. Certainty. That's correct. Okay. Now, let's assume, hypothetically, <laughs> that Mr. Smith is suffering from necrophilia, that Mr. Smith wants to kill Mr. Jones, to have sex with Mr. Jones after death. Make that assumption. That he calls Mr. Jones on the phone and invites him over to watch videos. His object is to get Mr. Jones in his apartment on the assumption I'm giving you in order to render him dead so he can have sex. Okay? Mr. Jones doesn't come. Is Mr. Smith still suffering from a mental disease? Yes. Is his capacity to conform his conduct to the requirements of law sufficiently impaired in the abstract before Mr. Jones comes to his apartment if his plan is to kill that man? Yes. The fact that Mr. Jones doesn't show up doesn't mean that, that the person I'm talking about who wants to do the killing is suddenly conforming his conduct to the requirements of law, does it? No. Now Mr. Jones comes. Mr. Jones is someone who he saw, he never saw, or he thought he saw, but it's a different Mr. Jones. And that Mr. Jones that comes in is built like me, heavy set, uh, older. And he says, have a drink and go about your business. I don't want you. Does that mean that Mr. I forget who I've got as the bad guy, but 
Does that mean that that fella at that time was able to conform his conduct to requirements of law? The person did not meet his specifications in terms of the type of body that he was attracted to. Well, he conformed to the requirements of law. He didn't kill him. That's right. Because he didn't want him. He didn't want him. But if he wanted him and killed him, in the hypothetical I just asked you, would he have been suffering from a mental disease to the point where he lacked substantial capacity to conform his conduct to requirements of law because the object of his mental disease was there and he was driven to carry it out? Yes. What if the same example, the man walks in and he has the body that he wants and they start to talk and they make an agreement between themselves that he says, I'm going to go now, but I'm going to be back in an hour. All right. So he lets him go. He comes back an hour and then he kills him. What has been the relative difference between the defendant's responsibility in those two instances? One, giving him an hour's leeway, and then, then when he comes back, killing him. Is he still impaired? Yes. Same degree of impairment? Yes. He didn't carry out the homicide. Therefore, he conformed his kind of requirements of law. Uh, let me make sure I have this right, Mr. Brill. The person came back, and he ultimately uh, rendered him comatose, killed him, and had sex with him. Yes. And the disorder is still there. Sure. But how about him giving him an hour of furlough? What happens uh, uh, to, to the conformity when he's given him an hour's furlough? It has no meaning, does it? No. Of course. Do you believe that Jeffrey Dahmer killed, based upon all the reports he gave to you, to a reasonable degree of psychological certainty? Do you believe that Jeffrey Dahmer was killing because he wanted the people to stay with him? I believe that Jeffrey Dahmer killed his victims because he is interested in engaging in sexual acts with um, either a total corpse or body parts of someone who's not living. Doctor, we're here in a homicide case, 15 of them. Jeffrey Dahmer had a necrophilia, which in your opinion was a mental disease. Yes. It is against the law, is it not? to give someone pills against their will. Yes, it is. It is against the law to rape and to take sexually assault a human being under any occasion, correct? Yes. When Jeffrey Dahmer, let's say, let me ask you this uh, hypothetical. Let's assume that Jeffrey Dahmer suffering from this mental disease to the same degree that you've told us had rendered somebody comatose, had sex with them, and the moment after he had sex with them, the moment after, before he was able to kill that person, the moment after, Jeffrey Dahmer died of a heart attack. Would he, in rendering that person comatose for the purposes of sexually assaulting them, Changed his mental disease at all? He still would have mental disease. That's correct. The object of his paraphilia would have been, as you have expressed it, to have sex when they're comatose and sex when they're dead. Let's take away the dead. He wasn't able to complete the death act because he died. Would he have been responsible for the sex act that he did, or would that have been the product of his mental disease? It would have been the product of his mental disease. So he would have been substantially impaired not to be able to conform to the conduct of the requirements of the law when he decided that in the course of his objects, he was going to do a number of things. One, render him comatose, have sex with him, and then kill him and have sex with him. Correct. So if he wasn't able to complete the killing because he died, he still would have been impaired substantially in the giving of him the pills and in the sexual assault. That's correct. And that's to a reasonable degree of psychological certainty. It is. At any time, with all the experience you've had in talking to paraphilias, people with severe paraphilic disorders, diseased or not diseased, a lot of people, I assume, have told you fanciful stories. 
They've malingered. They've made up things. Yeah. Did you ever find Jeffrey Dahmer inventing a psychosis to convince you that he was psychotic? I did not. Did he ever falsify symptoms in your professional opinion to a reasonable degree of psychological search? It's my opinion that he did not falsify symptoms. You are not suggesting, doctor, that every single person that he ever came in contact with who he thought of as an object of his desires was going to be dead if he got together with that person. No. It's when he got together with the person that he desired and committed the homicide. It's your testimony that at that time of that act, he met the standard. Um, Mr. Boyle, what I'm saying is that um, he had a certain mindset about the type of people that he was attracted to and their bodies that he was attracted to. And so if he came into contact with a person to whom he was attracted and wanted their body or body parts, um, because of the nature of the disease that he had, he could not conform his conduct. There was a question asked of you relative to uh, a gentleman, a black gentleman that he met in Chicago when he was on a vacation. It was the one that was uh, read to you, page 20. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go into it. The, uh, they went back to, Ms. To, to his apartment and Mr. Uh, Dahmer drugged him. He stated that for some reason he did not do anything else. He just masturbated and kissed the guy and the guy left. Remember that one? Yes, I do. He did not kill this man. And he told you why he did not kill this man. In the words that you read yesterday, and I believe Ms. Smith, uh, Ms. Smith read today, was he felt... Ms. White. Ms. White, I'm so sorry. How did I do that? I apologize. I had examples, I think. He did not kill this man, and he felt that it might be that he was not as attracted to him as he thought he would be. That's right? correct. Now, that certainly puts that man in a completely different category than anyone else that we're talking about who ended up as homicides, correct? I believe that he does. Did he ever tell you that I killed the guy after having sex with him, but I didn't find him attractive, so uh, I killed him anyway? He never told you that. No, he did not. Let me just check with him. Um, you were asked a question about flowers, Mr. Flowers, who escaped this potentially unfortunate incident to happen to others, right? Yes, I was. Grandmother sees him, flowers lives. Correct? Correct. Conorac Synthomasone is seen by the police and citizens, but he dies. Yes. Can you explain the difference? Um, I, I did not ask um, Jeffrey Dahmer what the difference was between the two. So um, okay. I. That's fair. Okay. I, 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 uh, I have a note here and I'm almost finished. I want to ask you about the DSM book. And, uh, this part about the cautionary part, correct? This is that cautionary part to make sure that people just don't say that everything in that book 
uh, is automatically integrated into the law? I, I think that's a fair statement to make. Well, <clears throat> assume that a person has this necrophilia and decides that what I'm going to do is to get a job at the county morgue. And they work at the county morgue, and I really want to make it absolutely clear I'm not suggesting this happens at all. I have no idea, but I have to use an example where a person would come in contact with dead bodies. And they work at that morgue, and they act out some of their fantasies. That doesn't mean they have a mental disease, does it? Well, if a person has sex with a dead body. I didn't say they had sex. They just work. Oh, I'm sorry. They just work there. No. They want to sit. They want to. They've got fantasies about it, but they never do anything about it. And they're not distressed by these fantasies. Yeah, they, they, you know, they, it, it, it's like a person who maybe is, is uh, pulled to look at at uh, uh, centerfolds and magazines, but they really want to do that. But it's something they just do. They, they, they still go about their business of working and everything. Mm -hmm. Let's make the assumption of the person who wants to work in a place where they can see corpses and they just see them. They don't do anything to them. Okay. That's still a necrophiliac? It's a necrophiliac if the person acts on the urges or is distressed by them. But if it doesn't bother them and they don't touch the bodies there, then that would not meet criteria for diagnosis. What about the person who continues to have sex, continues to do things with the dead body, more and more different things, more and more frequent things? They initially start, this is an assumption, they start touching a body once one month and then next month they're doing it three times a month and the following month they're now they're starting to try and have relations and now they're starting to take body parts and now they're doing more and more what about the progression of that person within the confines of of the paraphilic of his necrophilia if you act on the urges Okay, then you meet criteria for diagnosis. When it becomes more often and more often and more often, what, as a clinical psychologist, to a reasonable degree of psychological certainty, are you starting to conclude about that person? That the person, uh, that first of all, they're, they're not able, people should not be having sex or touching dead bodies for sexual purposes. And what I would conclude is that they've lost control over time, the fantasies have intensified, and they're not able to control their behavior relative to the corpse. That person may very well have a mental disease. Yes. Uh, that's okay. Sweet. It's very great. Dr. Becker, um, Mr. Boyle gave you one hypothetical about Jeffrey Dahmer not having or using alcohol um, during any one of these killings. There is no evidence in any of his reports that alcohol was not involved in any one of those killings, is there? Um, I, I think it's fair to say that's correct. Um, my understanding is that when weekends came, that he would consume up to 24 cans of beer. All right. So, and these homicides occurred on weekends, correct? Correct. Um, you also, or Mr. Boyle also, indicated that um, with the last black male, that the explanation for that person not dying, although Jeffrey Dahmer first says, I um, didn't kill him, he may not have been attractive enough, that that's a, an acceptable explanation for his not dying, correct? I would say that's ac acceptable. I don't know if that's the actual reason, but that would be one interpretation. Well, doctor, 
if that man fits his body type, and it's not that he's unattractive enough, and Jeffrey Dahmer has no other reason, then indeed we have the perfect situation and he conforms his conduct and doesn't kill, correct? You know, we're talking about we're, we're talking about a hypothetical where there is a person uh, who he's attracted to and brings him to his home and, and then him. does not kill this person. Right. Okay. He's not violated the law in doing that. He's conformed his conduct. As long as he's not drugged them or anything else. Okay. He has conformed his. No, he has drugged him. He said he drugged this man because we're dealing, are we not? with responsibility for the act of killing here, correct? Correct. Not motivation for killing, correct? You understand there is a distinction between those two, correct? Between uh, why motivation he decided to killing kill and the act of killing. Why he decided to kill and whether or not he's responsible for the act of killing. There are two different things, correct? Correct. And going back to my hypothetical, if he decided to kill because he didn't want a witness, then he's responsible, correct? Well, again, I have to say I don't like hypotheticals because there's a lot of other things that have to be taken into consideration. Don't and go. And I'm much more comfortable, Miss White, just with dealing, you know, with what he did. Let me go back to the question I asked, and I believe you answered because Mr. Boyles asked hypotheticals, and I, I didn't like it when he asked me either. So. <laughs> I know. I guess that that's one of the things that that happens. But let me go back, and I believe I'm repeating your answer. If his motivation for extinguishing the human life was to get rid of the witness to the fact that he drugged them and used them sexually. That act he is responsible for, correct? Given that the person was not psychotic. Right. And Jeffrey Dahmer, we're assuming non-psychosis, just okay. in the case of Jeffrey Dahmer. Right. He kills somebody just so that that person would not be able to tell that he had drugged them and had sex with them. And he was not interested in doing things sexually with the body after the act. Right. Correct. So he's, he is responsible. And that person also, we assume, understands the difference between right and wrong in the act of killing. You want me to assume that that person understood. Yes. And that person's responsible. Yes. Jeffrey Dahmer, however, you are saying is not responsible for that act of killing, although he knows the difference between right and wrong. He does not derive pleasure from the act of killing, but because there is something sexual he wishes to do with the dead body afterwards. That makes him non-responsible, correct? Can I, uh, I can answer that yes or no, um, but I'd like to be able to explain it. All right, would you like start me to with do? the yes or no. Okay. The, the answer is that makes him not responsible. Okay. May, may I explain it or? Go ahead. Okay. The, the, in my opinion, the nature of the disease that he has is such that the killing has to occur so that he is driven to have sex with a dead corpse or body parts. And to get to that point, the person has to be dead. Okay. A dead corpse or body parts, as long as they are attractive? Very specific. Very specific. Attractive. Male and young. Male, young, don't have cars because... <laughs> Okay. Male, young, don't have cards on a weekend when he's got time. <clears throat> after consuming alcohol. Mm -hmm. I, I think you have to answer aloud. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yes, so far to everything Miss White has said. 
very, very specific. In other words, we know he's not responsible for these 15 deaths because these 15 people died, correct? Um, do I have to say yes or no to that? I'd like you to. Part of why he is not responsible is because these 15 people died. And indeed, he indicated early on in some of his reports that at least one of them, David Thomas, he killed because he was afraid he'd wake up and be pissed off. He wasn't particularly attracted to him. That was early in his confession, correct? Correct. And you don't believe that, do you? I do not believe all of what Jeffrey Dahmer told me related to why he did what he did. Just one other thing. Um, going back to the... Per, um, the paraphilic actions that you described late yesterday that you developed in your last interview with Jeffrey Dahmer. In that regard, Dr. Berlin was right there with you during the conversation? He was. He was in the room with me. Okay. And as far as you know, participating in the conversation and hearing it? Did he hear what I had to say? What you had to say and what Jeffrey Dahmer had to say? Yes. Okay. I think that's all. Thank you again, Dr. Just two questions. Doctor, it was clear that when I asked you about this drinking episode, it's because it came up in the case of Mr. Miller. I wasn't in any way trying to imply that drinking was just limited to that. It's because you were asked questions about the Miller incident and the stabbing that I raised that question. Objection. She did comment on his motivation. Well, I want to ask, I, that was just the foundation to this question. I think it was a short speech. Well, it was. It wasn't a real long speech. It was a short speech. I agree. Apparently, <laughs> we have a stipulation it was a short speech. <laughs> okay. Doctor, the drinking that we're talking about in reference reference to Mr. Miller, did the fact that Jeffrey Dahmer told you that he had a drink in order to use the knife to cut the juggler vein of Mr. Miller, did that in any way alter your opinion that he was not responsible for that? Killing? No. The fact of the absence or the presence of drinking in any of the other homicides, is that a major factor in your decision that he was not mentally responsible? No, even if Mr. Dahmer did not drink, he still would have necrophilia. Doctor, Mr. Dahmer, you were asked a question by Ms. White about the homicide, if the homicide did not take place, uh, would he have not been responsible? And your answer was, in part, you're, you've made the answer. There was another part. What was the other part you wanted to express? He, it's my opinion, which I've stated a number of times, is that he has a mental disease, and that is what drives his behavior. Dr. Mr. Dahmer reported to you time and time again that he placed these people in a comatose state, correct? Yes. That while in a comatose state, he had sex with them? Yes. Your Honor, I'm going to object. I believe we're beyond the, the uh, bounds of re-redirect at this point. I think that my next question will show the reason I had to lay that foundation. Okay, just let me be clear that uh, the scope is limited at this point to the scope of the uh, uh, cross-examination. And I absolutely understand that. I think the next question, first two were foundations to the question that came up in recross. Why, before the act of murder, homicide did Mr. Dahmer report to you that he put these people in a comatose state? Objection. Irrelevant to cross. 
She opened up the door in her redirect, her refrog. Just, just a minute. I haven't asked for any argument. Yes, that's right. I'm, I'll allow the question. Objections overruled. Why did he tell me that he would put people into a comatose state? Um, for a couple of reasons. One, because it was much more arousing to him to be sexual with a person who was comatose and that he had control over the person. And uh, also that he didn't. I mean, if you want me to go on, there I are a do. number of things he said, and, and they are in my notes um, that he didn't have to entertain the person, that he didn't have to have very much in the way of interaction with the person. And did he in any way indicate to him, to you about his not wanting them to be conscious when he killed them? He told me that he didn't want, um, and this sounds unusual, but that he didn't want his victims to be in pain. And each and every one of his, the persons were unconscious at the time of death, as far as you know, from what he reported to you. In, in relation to the 15 cases yes, here, um, th th that's what my recollection is. No, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. You may step down here. We're going to need more than about 20 minutes. If I can't, my next witness is about 10 minutes away. Okay. Court in recess. <laughs>